Good morning. Today is the 29th day of November 2016. Our series, Seeking the New Poetry, A.E. Part 2. Some years ago, I came across a small book of A.E.'s entitled Song and its fountains. It is a remarkable book. First published in 1932. What moved me greatly was the honesty of A.E as poet, mystic, humanitarian. It opens with this quote from the Chaldean oracles. Explore the river of the soul, whence or in what order you have come, so that although you have become a servant to the body, you may again rise to the order from which you descended, joining works to sacred reason. I'm going to read <clears throat> from chapter 8, although there is much here that I would like to share in the future. The compelling honesty of the poet is brought out significantly in this chapter. He writes, I am a far exile from that great glory which inhabits the universe and can but peer through some momentary dusky transparency in my nature to a greater light than the light of day. I know the royal road is by practice of the great virtues, but I cannot speak that language or urge those obligations. I, who have been angry and sensual, I can only speak where I have been faithful. I have never ceased from the inward search and might by that faithfulness have gone far if I had not a rabble of desires tugging me by the skirts to travel alluring roads in the world of illusion. I could peer only a little way, apprehending behind form the creator, behind thought, the thinker, behind intuition, the seer, behind conscience, the love. And in fallen life, some still unfallen majesty, and even in the basest desires, could find signs of their spiritual ancestry. And then he gives us four lines from one of his poems. There was never sin of thine, but within its heart did dwell a beauty that could whisper thee of the high heaven from which it fell. I tell what I have surmised or discovered by reason perhaps of that uncorrupted spiritual atom in my nature. I know there must be error even in our highest approaches to the true if the whole nature has not been purified and made transparent. Emanations from our dark 
untransmuted desires must discolor our vision. The deepest things in my life came to me in the form of poetry. And I brooded upon every circumstance in its uprising that I might discover its ancestral fountain. However slight may be the song contrasted with the great poetry of the world, it was as high above my normal mood as that great poetry is above mine. I could not but wonder at it, for at times there was some magic in its coming which seemed almost to dissolve the personality. A music would be born in the depths of being which could not get completely incarnated in the words, but which swept them together until they were not at all like the stumbling, almost inarticulate speech of the boy. I remember, as if yesterday, that day in my youth when a mystical music was born in me before ever thought came, or the words that followed. And he quotes another poem. When the breath of twilight blows to flame the misty skies, all its vaporous sapphire, violet glow, and silver gleam, with their magic f flood me through the gateway of the eyes. I am one with the twilight stream. When the trees and skies and fields are one in their dusky mood, every heart of man is wrapped within the mother's breast, full of peace and sleep and dream in the vasty quietude. I am one with their hearts at rest. From our immemorial joys of hearth and home and love, strayed away along the margin of the unknown tide, all its reach of soundless calm can thrill me far above words or touch from the lips beside. I and deep and deep and deeper let me drink and draw from the olden fountain more than light or peace or dream, such primeval being as o'er fills the heart with awe, growing one with its silent stream. He continues, by the magic of that music which so rose within me the universe seemed to reel away from me and to be remote and unsubstantial as the most distant nebulae. And for some minutes, I was able to recreate within myself the musical movement of the power and could stay the soul upon the high uplands. But it quickly vanished as a dream might go after our waking. And try as I might, I could not recall it again. But for a moment, I understood what power might be in sound or incantation. It made me understand a little of those mystics who speak of traveling up a Jacob's Ladder of Sound to the Logos, the fountain of all melody. I found later, if meditation on the spirit is prolonged and profound enough, we enter on a state where our being is musical. Not a music heard without, but felt within, as if the soul itself had become music, or had drawn nigh 
to the ray of the Logos, the master singer, and was for that instant part of its multitudinous song. While, and then he quotes the title of a poem, by the margin of the great deep was being conceived, I felt that music in my being before the words were swept together, a state akin to that I experienced waking in dream when I followed in their descending order the phases from deep own being through images or symbols to their last echo in words. I held these memories with others akin to them, hoping that at last I might understand the psyche and come to some mastery of the hidden powers. I do not think we shall ever come to truth otherwise than by such gropings in the cave of the soul when with shut eyes we are in a dim, illuminated darkness and seek through transient transparencies to peer into the profundities of being. It is the most exciting of all adventures, the exploration of the psyche. Even though the windows out of which we gaze are soon darkened for us, by our own bodily emanations. Yet there are enchanted moments when we have vision, however distant, of the divinities who uphold the universe. It is true we are at an immense distance from their greatness and see them as a shepherd boy far among, away among his hills might see the glittering of the army of a great king, and he is awed by the majesty and bows low at the vision of greatness and dreams over it when the army is passed and he turns to his humble task with his sheep. So remotely is it I have apprehended splendors overshadowing my insignificance. They stand over all of us I think if we chose the least inspiring among those we know, one seeming not at all puissant or entitled to respect, and could know the immortal powers which uphold the frailty of his being, his darkened life would seem to the imagination to move in a blaze of glory. There are many who would speak lightly of the serious mood in which I pondered over the songs which I think of as oracles out of the psyche. Yet they themselves may pay reverence to the voices of conscience or of intuition, which also are oracles out of undiscovered, undiscovered depths in our being. And intuition and conscience may utter themselves in song as well, as in fugitive illuminations of mind, heart, or will. My meditations were all intent on the discovery of the nature of soul and spirit. I write now in age, remembering indeed the circumstance about the writing of poetry. But there is some blurring of intensity and keenness of mind, and I cannot recreate the old intensity of emotion or thought. Of course, he goes on, but I wanted to share with you his words, and I'll conclude with one of his poems. Now the quietude of earth nestles deep my heart within. Friendships new and strange have birth since I left 
the city's din. Here the tempest stays its guile, like a big kind brother plays, romps and pauses here a while from its immemorial ways. Now the silver light of dawn, slipping through the leaves that fleck, my one window hurries on, throws its arms around my neck. Darkness to my doorway hies, lays her chin upon the roof, and her burning seraph eyes now no longer keep aloof. And the ancient mystery holds its hands out day by day, takes a chair and croons with me by my, by my cabin built of clay.